1876. On the snowy banks of the ice-choked Delaware River, General George Washington's few half-starved, ragged troops, badly beaten by the British in New York, are about to row across to New Jersey to launch a daring attack on Trenton. In the first boat is a courageous 18-year-old lieutenant from Virginia setting out on an event of destiny. Cut by the biting wind, Washington and the rest of the shivering troops follow during the night. And then the slogging march, 10 miles through mud and snow to surprise the Hessian mercenaries and redcoats, sleeping off the wine and rich food of the Christmas celebration. The lieutenant is one of a 50-man vanguard that reaches Trenton first. Just after dawn, he leads a heroic charge that assures an American victory by preventing the Hessians from getting their artillery into position. But as Trenton is being captured, the event which brings new hope to the desperate American cause, the young lieutenant is hit by a musket ball in his shoulder, an artery is severed, and he almost bleeds to death. His name is James Monroe, and had he died on these icy streets of Trenton, another event deeply affecting the world from then until today would not have taken place at the White House, Washington, D.C., 1823. The Revolutionary War Lieutenant is now the 65-year-old President of the United States. The President and his cabinet hold stormy sessions over what action to take on an implied threat to the Western Hemisphere. Fearful that European powers, on a rising wave of monarchy and despotism, will attempt to recapture the former Spanish possessions in South America that have set up independent governments, and worried that Imperial Russia will push active colonization on the Pacific Coast mainland, the President, in his annual message to Congress, pens a decisive self-preservation policy for the Americas, which later becomes known as the Monroe Doctrine. Boldly, James Monroe states that the American continents are no longer open to European colonization, that any attempt to extend their political systems to the Western Hemisphere will be dangerous to the United States, that any move to control the new Latin American republics will be considered unfriendly to the United States. And bold it is, for Monroe has only a handful of ships and a small, weak army to back his hands-off doctrine, a doctrine that is dramatically called to mind today as Russia and Cuba play a dangerous game of brinksmanship only 90 miles from the Florida coast. James Monroe, for half a century, he helped the United States make the transition from revolutionary colonies to a nation of international importance. Let's look at this unusual man and the doctrine that bears his name. Monroe's Scottish ancestors settled in Westmoreland County, Virginia, 100 years before James is born in spring 1758, on a small plantation on the edge of the forest where Monroe Creek meets the Potomac. Initially educated by tutors, James is seven when he hears stirring talk at home of the British passing the Stamp Act, and the 13 colonies ablaze with defiant opposition to this taxation of patriot Patrick Henry's fiery speech, if this be treason, make the most of it. At 12, the serious lad is walking several miles to school each day, talking excitedly of such dramatic events as the Boston Massacre, with his 14-year-old friend John Marshall, one day to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. A crack shot, James keeps the family table supplied with game birds, gathered on his way to and from the small academy of Parson Campbell, a stern disciplinarian who teaches young Monroe mathematics, Latin, and the classics. 1774, Williamsburg. At the capital of the colony, revolution is in the air. Virginians meet at the teeming city in a patriotic fervor. Here, at age 16, comes tall, shy James Monroe, 
to continue his studies at the College of William and Mary. But can a young Virginian, his blood stirred by the news of Lexington and Concord, keep his mind on books when political and military events are reaching a climax? As James joins one of the volunteer military companies at the college and grills on the palace green under the very nose of the king's governor, word comes from Richmond St. John's Church of Patrick Henry's impassioned speech, which ends with the immortal words, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And so, two years' studies are interrupted as James becomes a lieutenant in the 3rd Virginia Regiment. The rising tide of the revolution has turned Monroe from a student into a soldier. 1776 is a year of hardship and disaster for the teenage officer, as Monroe's regiment joins General Washington's army in New York. The battles of Harlem Heights and White Plains are stinging defeats. Monroe and his comrades in arms are forced into desperate retreat to Pennsylvania, tortured by hunger and cold, the Redcoats snapping at their heels. Then the hand-to-hand -hand fighting at Trenton, which was already recounted, with Monroe risking death for victory. 1777, the bloody Battle of Brandywine, the fog-shrouded skirmishes at Germantown, followed by the freezing winter hell of Valley Forge. Now a major, he scouts enemy positions for intelligence reports for General Washington. 1778, Monroe is in the thick of the blistering Battle of Monmouth, where soldiers who escaped shot and shell die of heat and exhaustion. And finally, Virginia Governor Thomas Jefferson sends 22-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Monroe to the Carolinas to assess British strength and act as liaison with the American forces in the South. The revolution is over for Monroe, who never dreams that someday he will be Secretary of War. Yet, James Monroe knows even now that a career in politics is what he wants, and he realizes that to achieve it, he must become a lawyer. He studies law for three years under Governor Jefferson, a brilliant statesman and lawyer, for whom Monroe is also an aide. He becomes a political disciple and lifelong close friend of his teacher, who helps Monroe on his great career of public service that will someday lead to the presidency. In 1786, admitted to the bar, Monroe opens a law practice in a picturesque red brick building in Fredericksburg, a building that still stands today as a museum and library to his memory. His law practice is busy and successful throughout the state, but Fredericksburg is his home. This is the house in which he lives in Fredericksburg, to which he brings his bride, for it is the same year in which he falls deeply in love and marries a beautiful 17-year-old New York aristocrat, regal Elizabeth Courtright, who is to share his busy life for almost half a century. And busy it is. Only 24, he goes to Richmond, elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. A year later, he is in Annapolis, one of the youngest members of the Fourth Continental Congress. There, with deep emotion, he watches as General George Washington resigns as Commander-in-Chief of the Revolutionary Forces. Monroe participates in the ratification of the peace treaty with Great Britain to end officially the war for which he almost gave his life. Then, with firmness and integrity, Monroe becomes the champion in Congress of the pioneer Western settlers, advocating that the Western lands between the Allegheny Mountains and the Mississippi move quickly toward statehood and self-government. Tied to this, is his strong fight in Congress to force Spain, which at that time owned the lands west of the Mississippi, to guarantee the United States free navigation of the Great River. Thus, Monroe aligns himself with the expansion and destiny of the entire country, rather than the moneyed interests of eastern shippers and merchants. At age 30, he is back in Richmond, 
a delegate to the state convention to ratify the new Constitution of the United States. He tries to compromise strong central government with fair states' rights. At age 32, he is in Philadelphia, a senator from Virginia to the first Congress of the United States, demanding the end of secrecy in congressional sessions and pressing for the civil liberties of a Bill of Rights. For some of this time, he lives at Monroe Hill in Charlottesville, where he owned all the land that eventually became the University of Virginia. And he also buys land on the outskirts of Charlottesville within sight of Jefferson's Monticello, hoping to build his home there, a dream sadly destined not to come true, for he can only build a little part of it before the pressure of politics takes him away. 1794, at age 36, Monroe is now minister to revolution-torn France. French and English warships are still battling on the seas, and Monroe does not realize that he really has been sent to allay French suspicions. While in Great Britain, American diplomat John Jay is working out a treaty with the English. Messages in this dispatch box from President Washington tell Monroe to walk the tightrope of strict neutrality. But Monroe's strong pro-French sentiments cause him to warmly endorse the French, which angers the Federalists at home, who feel that this may endanger Jay's work across the Channel. When the Jay Treaty with England is completed, Monroe is largely caught unawares, and the French will not believe his written, truthful assurances that he had not been part of America's pro-British political intrigue. Totally out of favor in Paris, and recalled angrily by the Federalists for not strongly defending the Jay Treaty to France, Monroe bitterly packs his trunks to return to the United States, feeling that he has been betrayed by the administration. However, seven years later, his diplomatic fortunes improved for a while when President Jefferson sends him to France to acquire navigation rights on the Mississippi and to buy New Orleans for two million dollars to assure safe access to the Gulf of Mexico. Dressed in this court suit, Monroe meets Napoleon's negotiators at the Louvre. Needing money and anxious to hurt Great Britain, Bonaparte offers Monroe and Robert Livingston the entire one million square miles of territory west of the Mississippi for $15 million. With no time to get approval from Jefferson to spend the extra $13 million, Livingston and Monroe courageously make the Louisiana Purchase that doubles the size of the United States. With his sash and court rapier, Monroe is off to England, where he fails to get the kind of treaty on British naval impressment of American seamen that Jefferson wishes. It looks as though Monroe's fortunes are at low ebb again. But, in fact, his star is really on the rise. For ahead, lies a series of dramatic successes ending in the presidency and the Monroe Doctrine.